Um, good afternoon. On behalf of all the partners, it's a pleasure to welcome you for this session on PhD career development. My name is Be uh, Berenice Kamp from ABG, Association Bernard Grégory, uh, an association which is strongly committed to career development and recruitment of PhDs in France and in Europe. I will be chairing the session together with my colleague Tao Lang and Chelsea, Alison and Helen from Scholars at Risk EUA and POSE. Uh, we will be in charge of managing your questions. The purpose of this session is to give you uh, concrete information and advice on how you can manage your transition out of academia because we're going to focus really on career development outside of academia. We won't talk or we won't address academic career development. That's really important for me to insist on that. So we are, you are going to get this information and advice, uh, maybe by being inspired by our speakers' um, experiences, by getting information on the job market. And by that, I mean uh, more specifically information on career options um, outside of academia, as I already said, because it's not easy, uh, maybe for you as a PhD or young researchers, not easy to know which opportunities are out there. So that's really the purpose of this session. Regarding the organization of the session, there will be a first part uh, during which uh, our speakers will be um, sharing their experience as PhDs now working in non-academic organizations. It will be more or less one hour. And then it will be then followed by a Q&A time with you participants. So basically to ask your questions, I'm inviting you actually to type your questions um, in the Q&A tab uh, you can find at the bottom of your screen. Please keep in mind that uh, we can't address personal issues and that your questions must be clear and precise. If not, it will be very complicated for us to ask your own questions to speakers. So please keep that in mind, clear, precise, and no personal matters um, in the questions. And Last uh, information, when you decide to post a question in this Q&A tab, you can decide either to give your name or to remain anonymous. So that's really important for you to, to know that. So uh, do as you, as you want. So now I'm finished uh, with this kind of presentation. So um, we are going to start. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, in name of all the partners, uh, our speakers uh, for invite, for having accepted this invitation and for taking the time to share their experience. Thank you very much and welcome to you. Um, Aziza, Niagali, Anna Maria and Sabine, it's a pleasure to, to, to welcome you as a speaker. So I'm not going to present yourself, but you are going to do the job basically. So uh, my first question, question, sorry, is who are you? Can you tell us more about your background, uh, the different career steps you went through um, after your PhD, and also maybe to insist or to explain um, the reasons why you decided to leave academia, uh, to opt out of academia, and also maybe all the motivations you have uh, behind all your professional choices. So um, I will start with my, uh, on the right side uh, on my screen. So uh, Aziza, um, do you mind starting? Sure, thank you very much Berenice and Tao for the opportunity um, and glad to be in this discussion with all of you. So uh, my name is Aziz Bush. I work at the OECD. The OECD stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. For those of you that don't know the OECD, this is an intergovernmental organization that was set up to implement the, the Marshall Plan after the Second World War. And uh, our job is basically to advise governments on how to design and implement better policies for better lives. So we're very much a sort of global think tank. Um, we produce data. We give uh, recommendations to different governments and we uh, do a lot of country specific or international type of uh, benchmarks. Um, so I basically defended my PhD back in 2009. I've been working at the OECD uh, since then. I actually started in 2007. Um, my background is a mix of uh, international business and trade and geography, which is actually the topic of the PhD that I took. Um, I studied after uh, high school foreign languages applied to international trade, what French people called LEA, Langues étrangères appliquées. 
Um, and then I did a, a first master's degree in international business at University of Paris Dauphine before joining the French Institute of Geopolitics where I uh, did uh, a second master's degree and, and, uh, and geopolitics uh, PhD. Um, I think for me, the main uh, reason uh, for first at the time doing a PhD, which is very helpful for my career today, is really to have a very concrete specialization and expertise in a, in a very specific field, which uh, today is uh, cities, urban policies and sustainable development. I'm heading a division that has about 30 plus economists that uh, work on, on these different issues. But I started my career at the OECD, setting up and managing for almost a decade the water governance program of the OECD. And that's actually the sectoral expertise that I did in my PhD, uh, which was on the privatization of water management uh, in Argentina. So this was very much a first um, rationale. Uh, before joining the OECD and while doing the PhD, I worked in different places. I worked um, in an NGO, Reporters Without Borders, for almost a year and a half, uh, where I set up the refugees desk. Uh, we were basically helping journalists uh, that were persecuted in their countries seek asylum uh, in France. At, then worked at ESSEC Business School for an additional two years. Uh, and I was also teaching at the University of Sergi Pontoise, a mix of um, US civilization and, and geo geography at the time. And so going back to your second question of why leaving academia um, after I'd say three to four years of teaching, I felt very much that I needed uh, something that was not only pure research, which I still actually do in my job, because a lot of the work that we're doing is building the evidence base that can guide decision making. So a lot of it has to do with uh, tapping into the scientific wisdom and the academic uh, literature. But I needed something that was also a bit more operational and practical. And that's maybe something that you get in the field of public policy, because you work hand in hand with you know, ministers and stakeholders that ultimately make reforms and, and guide um, public action. So this shift from something that was a, a, a heavy investment, I have to say, in uh, building expertise and, and diving into a specific topic into something that is maybe a bit more pragmatic was uh, one of the reasons why uh, I, I considered other other avenues, I would say, for uh, for for my career development. I know I have to be short, so let me know, Berenice, if this is enough to get started. I'm, I'm happy to bounce back later. You're on mute. I don't hear you. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Aliza. Uh, it will be fine for the moment, and we are going to deepen this question, especially uh, regarding this uh, career development. So for the start, it, it's, uh, it's perfect. Thank you. So let's move now to, to Yunia Gale because um, you, are, you don't have a similar uh, background, but it's um, quite, uh, there are some similarities with uh, what Aziza said. So if you don't mind, uh, keep uh, doing this uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So indeed, uh, there, are, there, is a num there are a number of uh, similarities in uh, our background and uh, choices. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I uh, completed my PhD in 2002, at the very end of 2002, at uh, Sciences Po uh, Paris uh, in uh, international relations, uh, political science. Uh, initially, I decided to complete a PhD because, in fact, I wanted to work in an international organization. I was very attracted by uh, multilateralism. And uh, I never initially thought I would work in academia. But uh, life is life. And I also do think it's very important to take into account uh, personal choices in uh, the way you are managing your own career. And uh, in fact, I had uh, kids uh, rather young. Uh, when I was uh, completing my, uh, my PhD. So my initial project to work uh, for the United Nations and to go on the ground, etc., uh, was uh, definitely not uh, realistic. And uh, I began to um, envision the possibility to work uh, in, uh, in academia. 
And uh, I, as soon as I completed my PhD, I was given the opportunity uh, to complete a postdoc at uh, the Institute, uh, uh, l'Institut de Recherche pour le mm -hmm. Développement, uh, IRD in France, uh, which uh, last two years or almost two years. Now an important thing also is that my uh, PhD I completed it rather quickly because in fact uh, I was lucky enough to uh, I've been given um, a book how do you say it? A scholarship. A scholarship, yes. Uh, first uh, from uh, Sciences Po initially but then also from the CNRS, uh, which is the National Center for Scientific Research in France, and the Ministry of Defense, because my PhD was dealing with uh, security-related matters, in particular with uh, French and uh, American security policies in Africa. Uh, so uh, it was uh, rather uh, uh, easy for me to complete. Uh, I, I completed my PhD on these three years, in fact thanks to uh, those uh, scholarships. And uh, then, um, as I was uh, saying, I entered uh, the EIRD as a, as a research, as a, as a postdoc. Uh, and then uh, I've been uh, hired by uh, the Institute of Development Studies, uh, IDS, uh, from the uh, University of Sussex in, uh, in the UK. But I still had this idea, uh, in fact, to, twice, which was a, a twice uh, aspect. The first one was that I still wanted to work with policy making and in particular for an international organization. Uh, second, I was uh, really uh, very attracted by uh, the kind of career that uh, PhD fellows uh, are able to follow in uh, Anglophone countries, uh, where it is possible to work both in academia, both in po policy making cycles. And uh, in fact, this is the way I've been following up, uh, because uh, after uh, uh, it was seven years in research, that's why I'm not exactly someone who left completely uh, academia from the very beginning, and even today I'm still working rather closely with the academia. But uh, then uh, I've been hired by a, a multilateral organization, which is the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, where I've been heading the peacekeeping and the peace building program for five years. But then I realized that uh, I was much more into uh, writing and uh, thinking, and uh, I decided to uh, work in a, for a think tank. I've been given the opportunity to work for a think, think tank, which is based uh, in, uh, in Africa, in Ghana. Uh, its name is the African Security Sector Network. So I am the chair of this uh, organization. And I'm working both with decision policymakers, but also with academia, in particular, uh, UCAM in uh, Montreal, and uh, also the King's College of London. Would you like me to continue, or is that enough? For, for the moment, that's enough, uh, because it's an uh, introduction part, and I'm going to ask uh, you more questions, because I already mentioned uh, some elements, uh, which may be very interesting for, for the um, attendees. So thank you very much, Niagali, for this first introduction. And now, uh, let's move to Barcelona in Spain. Uh, so Ana Maria and Sabine, can you present yourself? And uh, yeah, yeah, please. Ana Maria, would you like to talk? Sure. Well, I'm Ana Maria Donnarumma. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me say again that I'm very glad to be able to participate in this online group uh, discussion. And um, as my colleague uh, Sabina here, I work in Swiss Academic, that is a consulting company uh, addressed to the higher education research and innovation uh, sector. We help decision makers to take better, to inform their decisions through data analysis, uh, evidence-based analysis, and also through our knowledge of the, of the domain. 
And actually, as far as my background is concerned, I have a slightly different, well, very different background from the other panelists because I actually have a PhD in physical sciences. In particular, I have a PhD in astronomy that, uh, from the University of Bologna. And, uh, but uh, I have uh, the chance and I'm lucky enough to collaborate with many uh, colleagues that have PhD in the humanities and social sciences. And with Sabine, I have participated to several recruitment processes. So we'll try to give here also my perspective on the many qualities and many expertise that we do appreciate in the people that have PhDs in humanities and social sciences. And as far as the uh, evolution that led me here to see this, uh, after my PhD, I had actually four years of postdoc, both in Italy and in France. And uh, at the end of my second postdoc in France, uh, I really started thinking about a career change. Uh, and the reasons were, first of all, um, from a very practical point of view, I was looking for a maybe more stable career, and I couldn't see any medium or term opportunities for having a, uh, for having a more a permanent position. And also, uh, I was while I was still loving the and I still love the, the domain uh, and, you know, in which I worked, I was not so happy anymore about the uh, pure academia. So I decided to, to go and look for other opportunities. And actually, before coming uh, here at CIS, I had other, ex other experiences, and uh, namely, I worked as consulting in an engineering company in a more technology-oriented uh, field. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I, I decided it was not my, uh, I wanted something different. And I landed to see this, and here I am today. And Thank you, Maria. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just like Anna Maria, I would like to thank you for the invitation uh, to, to this great event. So my name is Sabine Plo. Uh, I have a PhD in philosophy from uh, Université Paris 1, Panthéon Sorbonne. Uh, and uh, in my case, uh, I could participate here uh, for two reasons. One, because I'm a, a PhD humanities uh, alumni uh, who now works uh, in a non-academic sector. And second, because as Anna Maria was saying, uh, I have also uh, uh, recruiting responsibilities within cities. And in this respect, uh, we uh, have uh, several uh, opportunities to uh, examine the application of uh, uh, humanities uh, alumni or humanities uh, uh, PhDs. So in my case, uh, what uh, brought me here at uh, CS Academic well, basically, I, so as I said, I have a PhD in philosophy. I also have the uh, aggregation de philosophy for those who know uh, what, uh, what, what this uh, French monster uh, um, refers to. Uh, so my expected trajectory was to work uh, in the teaching field, for instance, uh, in high school with the aggregation, or um, as a researcher, teacher and researcher, uh, at the university. As a matter of fact, during my PhD and after my PhD, I've been working as an, um, what we call ATER, uh, so uh, contract-based uh, uh, teacher uh, and researcher at the university. So I did this for five years uh, in uh, Université Paris 1, then for two years uh, at uh, Université de Strasbourg. Then I was proposed the opportunity to uh, contribute to the first step of implementation of a PSL Research University in Paris. So PSL is the uh, result from, uh, uh, at this time it was a federation uh, of institutions. Now it's more a bit of a merger, but at this time it was still a, a federation. And it was a brand new project. So first step of implementation with a huge um, dotation uh, from uh, the French government. So uh, um, there were really many things to, to, to create uh, and to set up from scratch. And uh, very few people to do it were a very small team uh, at the time. So I was working with the president of uh, PSL for this implementation. And this was very versatile because we were doing a bit of everything, teaching, research, innovation, international relations. Being a very small team, we had to be um, completely polyvalent. So I gained uh, a lot of experience about the inner uh, uh, structuration and, and mechanisms of the uh, academia. And uh, after uh, three years working uh, at PSL, I interacted with uh, a former uh, um, PhD uh, mate uh, who 
whom I had uh, exchanged with you during my, my PhD, who had created this company, uh, Sirius Academic, with uh, other colleagues. And uh, they invited me, they said, look, we are growing. We are looking for people who really know the, 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 the let's say, unwritten rules of the academia. Uh, so we would like to discuss with you on possible collaboration. Uh, I came to Barcelona to visit the company. I liked it. They made me an offer. And this is how I started uh, working in this consulting company. Um, and so I've been here now for uh, five years. Uh, I think I've gained, again, a lot of, uh, of experience. And for me, it's a very positive, uh, a very positive move. Uh, and I absolutely have no regrets about uh, leaving the academia. In our case, it's a bit specific because we have left the academia, but we work with academics. In fact, now, for instance, uh, I have opportunities to work with PSM, whom I was an employee of before. So we are completely still immersed in, in this world, but in a different, uh, in a different perspective. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, Sabine. So I will try uh, my best to include your questions, uh, questions of attendees uh, in our discussion. And uh, the question is coming from one of the participants. It's about um, approaching the job market. And they would like to know how basically you got such opportunities. Because, uh, for instance, Niagale, you said uh, you were given the opportunity uh, to work in a specific uh, position. Aziza, you were talking on expertise. So my question is, how can you get uh, this opportunity? Did you create those opportunities? Um, how come uh, you went to this idea of becoming a team manager in an inter international organization or expert in your field or consultant uh, in the case of series? Can you tell us more about how you approach the job market as a PhD and maybe as international PhDs in a foreign country? Who wants to start? I can go first if yeah. you want. Um, so, so I think it's very important to make plans and, and to have a clear idea of uh, while you are doing your PhD, what you like and what you don't like and where you'd like to be or where you would not like to be. Although I think it's uh, very tricky to do this. The younger you are, the more challenging this uh, this is. But uh, at the same time, I think that life is actually what happens when you spend your time doing plans. The reality is that you don't always plan for where you are landing. And a lot in career development is just related to sometimes being in the right place at the right uh, moment, sometimes being proactive, sometimes accepting to take risks. Uh, and it's a bit of a mix of, of all that. But, but I think the bottom line is that you should know at least w what you don't want to do. So that's the, the philosophical principle. Now, as far as I am concerned, um, the, the very first career, uh, like, full-fledged uh, development that I had was at ESSEC Business School. I was actually starting the PhD at the time and I just applied to a vacancy. So it was uh, very straightforward. There was the uh, APEC at the time, which is the sort of executive's employment uh, spot. And I applied and then I got a phone call and I passed a number of tests and I was 25 and I, I just got in. Um, what I did in, in Reporters Without Borders two years before that was just an internship that I had received via a long uh, distribution list. Uh, and then I started as an intern. And then from the intern, I was given, you know, opportunities in, in the NGO. But the, the very first formal application for a job at ESSEC was like a typical application. Now, um, the OECD was a bit different because I, I, I had actually been working for two years at ESSEC Business School doing my PhD in parallel, having field trips in Argentina. I mean, all this made it very complicated at some point, and I felt I needed to slow down somehow the professional um, pace to be able to actually do the research and write the, the dissertation. So those two years were very nice to save some money. And then I thought, 
maybe it's time to lock yourselves in your in a room and and just finish your your dissertation but happens that in one of the trainings i was giving because my job at ESSEC was really teaching negotiation to officials at the european commission and to mba students there was one participant that used to be an oecd official and that you know over lunch told me why don't you try? They're looking for interns, maybe a good step. And so I literally left my job and accepted the internship, which was at the time unpaid, but it was half time. So it was giving me the window somehow to really invest in the research. It was still keeping me linked and connected to the professional environment. And it was putting a door uh, open or putting a foot, I would say, in, in a landscape that we know is tricky. You need to get into these international organizations at some point. And then from then on, you know, it was, I, I joined the OECD as an intern back in 2007. And I think in 10 years, I just moved from intern to head of division, but that was like, it was really a combination of factors, you know, uh, hard work, but also opportunities, uh, dedication, uh, being proactive, accepting to change environment, accepting to stop being the expert and jumping into more managerial types of responsibilities. Networking is also extremely important, not only within the organization, but also outside, especially in these jobs that are that have a very strong political feature, even if they do have a lot of technical, uh, you know, requisites. So so I'd say it's, it's really a mix of a lot of things. It's not like you have a linear plan and, and that's how things happen. But in my case, there were, I think, two big game changers. The first one was to to accept to quit a job that was paid, but that was too time consuming and not allowing me to finish my research, to jump into something that was unpaid, but maybe providing an entry door to uh, a, new, a new career development. And then the second one was probably keeping an eye open once in the organization and, and really keeping an eye open on, on the different opportunities to go vertical, you know, when, when opportunities were actually pro provided. So it's a mix really of being proactive, taking risks, um, daring, uh, but also uh, I have to say luck and, and hard work and, and some dedication. Thank you, Aziva. Niageli, do you want to talk about it? Oh, I think I could not agree more uh, with uh, Aziza. Uh, I think that, yes, uh, it is both very important to know where you want to go. Uh, that's for sure, because after 15 or more years, uh, I realized that today I'm exactly where I wanted to be. But uh, it's not, it hasn't been straightforward, not at all. Uh, what I forgot to mention is that, is that after uh, or during, even during, uh, when I was completing my postdoc, uh, in fact, I've been applying two different positions in academia, in a CNRS, or uh, I, uh, I was uh, able to uh, be given uh, my, um, I cannot remember the name even in French, uh, my qualification, my qualification. So I was uh, allowed to become a maître de conférence. Uh, so I made a lot of applications in, uh, in French universities. Uh, then I prepared uh, for the, the aggregation but only a little bit. Huh? To be honest, I, I've been investing much more in uh, uh, interviews uh, uh, in academia, in universities, than uh, for the, the aggregation itself. Uh, but I think, today, and I was never successful, in fact. But today, I think that people who uh, didn't uh, consider my application were completely right because that was not exactly what I was uh, aiming to do, what I was aiming to become. Uh, I've been also teaching at uh, Sciences Po Paris. Uh, I've been a maître de conférence uh, for uh, two years uh, and I'm not sure that I was the best uh, teacher uh, in the world, to, <laughs> to, be, uh, to be honest. And uh, um, it hasn't been also so easy uh, for me to uh, uh, enter an international organization. In fact, I was finally hired uh, by the organization of La Francophonie uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, but the, the first application I made, I made was in uh, 20, 
all four. So uh, six years. And uh, meanwhile, I also uh, made a lot, a lot of application to the United Nations, but as I indicated, it was not easy for me uh, to accept because in fact I have four kids. So uh, it's, uh, it's not straightforward. That's very important to know, but what I, always knew is that I wanted to work both in policy making and in not necessarily in academia itself but with academia and you have these kind of actors there are not a lot in France but there are a lot in the world uh, which are the think tanks and uh, today uh, I am uh, uh, chairing and uh, managing a think tank. So that's exactly what I wanted to do because I'm invited both uh, in an academic conference or in a, a United Nations uh, conference or in a, um, French or other or nations conference. I'm also working abroad a lot because I, I as indicated, I was I, I completed my PhD in international relations, which was. Uh, also very important, but what I can say is that today uh, having the title of PhD is clearly an asset and I think it's always has been in fact. Thank you, Niagali. Anna Maria and Sabine? Yes, well first of all if I, uh, I want to, to stress how, I, how much I agree with the design in Niagali, uh, in particular with the fact of I think that one of the first steps really in um, um, approaching a search for a non-academic job is to understand, as they were saying, what you like and what you would like to do. And also maybe what I would add is also uh, acknowledge what you're good at. In the sense that, at least for me, uh, it was at the beginning not easy to understand that I could have a video as a PhD in astronomy outside, uh, outside academia because uh, I could see that it looked to me that most of my skills were really related to uh, a very specific uh, uh, domain of scientific research. And so the first thing that I think was very useful for, uh, for me was to understand that knowledge was, uh, was, uh, was uh, what I was good at. I also contacted, for example, the career development service that helped me to understand what were actually the competencies and the transferable skills that everybody talks about, talks about they had acquired during my research background. So I think this is the first thing, really try to understand what you want to do. And, uh, and what you like to do and guide your uh, just, uh, employment research accordingly. It won't be maybe the first job that you get, it will be the, the job of your life or the job that you would like, but every job that you take will help you, will help you to understand better what, you, what you're looking in a job and what you ideally will not like to do in a job. And also another thing that I cannot stress uh, enough is the fact of talking with people. So uh, talk with, researchers that have changed their career or that are thinking of changing their career, even if it's, if it's, in, if it's uh, in different domains, because they can really give you a different perspective, a different point of view, and then you understand, first of all, see that maybe uh, if you're struggling, other people are struggling, and this is, it doesn't mean that you won't be able to find a job at Tel Academia, just that it's a process and that you, as, as I was mentioning, there are some risks that needs to be, uh, to be taken, but if you're willing to embrace the, the risks, then you might find a good solution. And finally, networks, because actually the, the, the job that I found, I would never thought of working in a consulting company like Sirius. I, I, I didn't know about the existence of Sirius up until actually a person posted a job ID uh, of Sirius in the uh, web page for jobs for astronomers outside academia. So really explore as many resources as you can uh, in uh, internet, search and be really proactive in looking for information about opportunities. And, uh, so thank you Ana Maria. In my case, uh, to be honest, nothing was planned at all. Uh, actually, it, it even broke uh, all the plans. In fact, I never uh, applied for a job in my life. <laughs> they, they, they came to me. In which sense did they came to me? So first uh, for PSL, uh, well, basically, uh, someone, some senior researcher from the small microcosm uh, in which I was studying uh, philosophy called me one day and she said, uh, I spoke to the president of PSL, uh, she needs someone of your profile, if you're interested, you have to be there in one hour. So I dressed up, I went there, I was interviewed and uh, I was uh, hired uh, on the same day. I called uh, my administration, so the French Ministry of Education, 
to say I'm not coming this year because it was about just in like in the end of August, uh, beginning of September, normally I was supposed to start um, in high school in France. So I just did the, the necessary uh, administrative aspect and in two days I was working at PSL. Uh, in the case of uh, serious academics, so as I said, uh, I knew one of the founders from my previous studies and so I, I told a bit the, the, the story. Uh, I came to Barcelona, they made me an offer, I accepted. And something that's important, I think I would have maybe two conclusions to draw from uh, this trajectory. The first one is um, in fact the network, but in which sense uh, should we speak of network? Uh, in my case, I'm not a very friendly person. I mean, I'm not like the typical extrovert uh, who makes friends easily. On the contrary, I'm a rather cold person. So it's not about uh, being all the time, uh, speaking to people, exchanging on social network. But on the other hand, it's very important to have a reputation about the quality of your work. And uh, even though, just to, to summarize, I have a bit the reputation of being someone who's a bit cold, a bit unfriendly. On the other hand, I have the reputation to be very hardworking. And this is what uh, maybe led people to um, call me and then hire me. So first thing, so network, but network uh, where you are known for the quality of your uh, production, let's say. And the second message, in fact, uh, is also assuming uh, risk. Because it's true that uh, especially when I accepted the job offer uh, at Silis Academic, which was in Barcelona, I was living in Paris at the time, I had a job, I had an apartment, uh, I had a life there. And when I took this, this decision, uh, even my family or my friends told me, you're crazy, why are you giving up a job that is paid, uh, you have a, a long-term contract, uh, you're going to go in a city that you don't know, you don't speak the language, you don't know anybody there, are you crazy? And actually I assumed this risk and now uh, I'm extremely accomplished about it. And also I think that um, it would be much more difficult for me to enter civics academic now than it was at the time, because at the time everything was still in process, uh, in construction, completely dy dynamic. And I, I, took, I assumed the risk to integrate this structure, which was maybe not completely safe because it was uh, the beginning of this company. But also it, I, I had this opportunity to enter. Now Cilis is consolidated, we are growing, we are a strong company, but on the other hand, it's more difficult to enter. So it's a bit of a trade-off. You need to take the risk and if it works, well, you have made a, a great operation. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to come back to this um, differences between the academic uh, environment and the non-academic environment because we had uh, many questions on this topic. So the differences are on, are on different levels. So I would like uh, to, to ask you some questions, but of course, uh, just answer to the questions you are interested in, of course. So basically, when you change, when you leave academia for non-academic environment, how did you adjust? to these changes because we don't work the same way in academia as in non-academic settings, I would say. So how did you adjust and how long did you need to adjust to this new environment? And um, also regarding the qualification or expectations um, and especially people with recruiting activities um, uh, among the panelists. Why are you interested in recruiting PhDs? What can bring a PhD in your own organization? And if we relate this to uh, the recruitment of PhDs in humanities, uh, because most of the time researchers in humanities or social sciences don't see um, which assets or which benefits they can bring to a company. And the question was, uh, is it more difficult for us to find a job? How do you uh, answer this question? Um, can you tell us the differences between academic and non-academic settings and the value, added value, brought by your PhD and especially PhDs in uh, humanities and social sciences. Who would like to start? Aziza? Sure. Um, so I, I didn't spend enough time in academia to 
uh, actually face a sort of drastic uh, transition uh, to the new job. I mean, I was basically teaching between 23 and 27, up to 28. Um, I joined the OECD, I was 27. Um, for a year, I actually did both. Um, but I see, I see many similarities, uh, at least in the type of work that, that we are doing at the OECD. The first one is that there is a very strong drafting component. So anyone that has actually uh, invested in, in writing uh, is actually a big asset. There is also a very strong analytical uh, component. So the PhD being actually the opportunity to go very much in depth in a specific field of expertise. That's something that brings value in, in this type of organization. Um, and, and that's probably one of the reasons why the OECD is hiring a lot of PhDs. Uh, the bottom line is that those PhDs have to come up with a very specific expertise because this house is a bit like a government, you know, it's 3,600 staff that work on a range of public policies that go from environment to education to science, technology, uh, all the way through fiscal policy, uh, macroeconomics, uh, urban development. And we have directorates that are organized pretty much like a ministerial portfolio and they come with a very robust expertise. So things that have to do with, uh, you know, uh, international relations are, are a bit generic profiles for this type of expertise. So if you combine drafting, analytical content and the specific expertise, the PhD actually in the OECD is an asset, uh, more than maybe it can be perceived in the private sector as being, you know, overqualified. And, and actually half of the analytical staff at the OECD is still economists, so pure macro, micro uh, economic. But but we have more and more people that come from political science, geography, etc. So those are like the similarities I see between the two areas. Now, the main difference is for me, at least in the way I I, I experienced academia and teaching, um, uh, you know, in my early career, is that the constituencies are different. So you're not dealing with students, uh, and it's not a one-way process, it's more a two-way process with governments and stakeholders, and you're sometimes dealing with, you know, more high-profile uh, types of constituencies, whether it's ministers or other types of... So so the type of interaction is a bit different in terms of how you, tr you transfer your knowledge and your expertise to make it actually relevant for the constituencies. Um, and then I would say that for the OECD, when we hire profiles, and including me and my team, you see a clear difference between people that have been exposed to teaching in the past and people that have not. I mean, I think someone that, you know, at 23 is put in front of an amphitheater has a capacity to transfer the message and to make it explicit and uh, acquires very strong skills in public speaking than more than someone that has maybe been only on the pure investigation research and not been really in that teaching assignment. So I would say teaching is really a sort of asset. And you see actually a lot of OECD officials that continue to teach somehow uh, on the margins of their work um, in order to be more comfortable with this public speaking assignment. So that's, that's what I would say as my contribution. Thank you, Adiza. Yeah, get it? Okay, thank you. Uh, I will, uh, of course, answer your question, but I think uh, it is also related to uh, what uh, all uh, my uh, fellows have uh, uh, told about uh, the importance of uh, network. And uh, I fully agree that uh, a network is uh, above all uh, about uh, the reputation and the quality of your work. It's not about, yes, I have to go uh, to this uh, dinner, to attend this dinner, to attend this event, because you know you have a lot when you're working in uh, international uh, circles, be they uh, bilateral, diplomatic, or multilateral, or academic. You have a lot of e side events uh, where you are supposed to uh, make uh, some uh, networking. But uh, I think that the best way to, be, to build your own network is really about the way you're working, how professional you are. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the 
most beautiful compliment that I can receive is when I am told that I am a, a, a real professional. I think that's very important. And this has to do with uh, how uh, you are able to adapt yourself to different environments, uh, in fact. Uh, because uh, I, I think that the problem today is that PhDs are seen as completely uh, non-aware about uh, material uh, and uh, ground, uh, well, grounded realities, which is completely uh, untrue, I, uh, I think. And this is what you have to, uh, to, to, to demonstrate. Uh, and also, it, it is important uh, to uh, show that uh, ideas are also important uh, because you're all the time told, yes, but uh, you have to make very concrete recommendations, but you, re you realize that after some time, uh, yes, a concrete recommendation, if there is no uh, thinking and not uh, um, intel intellectual background, in fact, you always have uh, poor results. So I think it is an asset of uh, uh, people who do uh, all the uh, PhD. And also, of, of course, writing, uh, know how to write is very important. But also, and I think it is a peculiarity of uh, uh, French PhDs, uh, how to structure and organize your ideas is a very, very important asset. I've been working in different uh, national environments, and I know that, uh, for instance, uh, in the UK, they are very, very good at communication. It is something that, uh, in France, we are not very familiar with. But I think that the way you are able to organize the different ideas, to have this uh, kind of uh, uh, rational uh, approach uh, is also something which uh, do help a lot when you have to adapt yourself to a different uh, environment. Okay, Nayeli. Anna Maria and Sabine. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, talking about the adaptation, uh, the, how you have to adapt yourself after the PhD. Uh, in my case, the transition to an academic career was but first of all, um, as Adil was also mentioning, uh, you need to embrace the fact that you won't be the expert on that domain uh, unless you're, you're going to work in a domain which is very related to your uh, uh, academic background, which means that you will need to possibly learn something, something, you know, something new, which in my case was great. I really like to, to learn. And also, uh, I think that having a, a, a background in research helps you to learn very fast and very effectively. So you, we have been trained during our PhDs to, to learn, to understand, to um, assess problems. And this is something that will be very useful. Uh, at least it was very useful in my, uh, in all the experiences, the uh, uh, professional experience they had after my PhDs. And then there are other uh, types of specific skills I had to acquire, like for example, uh, a different approach to time <laughs> managing, because of course, I mean, in general, uh, at least in my case, the projects uh, in academia had a larger time scale, but in consulting in particular, they're uh, usually on a shorter time scale. And so it means that you need to think differently when you plan your, uh, your time, uh, you need to really improve a lot your organizational skills. But as far as the uh, expertise that PhDs have that we appreciate, first of all, uh, I think I hear CDS, it's a very peculiar uh, situation because actually, uh, we are about 30 people, about half of us as a PhD, or in any case, as a background in, the, uh, in research. So we really value and we really appreciate all the skills, the skills that uh, people with a PhD have. In particular, we have people that come from really different domains. Uh, I mean, well, astronomy, philosophy, one of the funding factors uh, comes from philosophy, two comes from archaeology. So we really value um, the expertise that you can acquire as PhD, being, for example, the ability of Develop, developing arguments, the ability of searching for information, understanding which information is relevant or not, the ability of understanding a problem, which is something that uh, cannot be a, uh, under, uh, cannot be overestimated. It's really important the fact that as a PhD, normally you're being confronted to uh, trying to understand a problem and trying to find a solution. And it's something that in consulting in particular is very, very important. 
And uh, also, as for when it comes uh, specifically to PhDs with uh, background in humanities and social sciences, I can give you my perspective of, of working with people with this background. I think it is great and it's very enriching. It's really, I mean, I appreciate, uh, for example, the, their ability of discuss, of writing well in terms of well-written reports and well-written argumentation, of adding uh, a, versus, a different approach to, 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 to some problems. I think it's really, it's really enriching, and uh, I think it's really a, a good approach to combine PhDs having a different uh, background. And Thank you. So, to add a few things, I totally agree with everything that uh, you said, uh, Anna Maria. I think that, in fact, the, the issue of uh, rhythm is, is quite important. For me, it's a major uh, difference between the academic activity and the activity of consulting, especially in a private sector. Uh, in the private sector, in the case of our company, for instance, you have very strict deadlines, they can be short, maybe they don't match your uh, personal planning, but you have to respect them. Why? Because we have a contract with a client and we cannot break uh, this, um, this contract. So it may involve some sacrifices and also it involves uh, some kind of uh, a responsibility, especially for a middle-sized company. Uh, we need to go and find contracts and we need to fulfill the contracts. Otherwise, the company is no longer sustainable, and this has consequences on all the people from the company, including you. So you must assume this part of the responsibility, uh, and it's, uh, we, it's a kind of a pressure, which is, of course, not so strong on employees than on uh, partners, but which is still distributed uh, uh, among uh, employees. As for uh, the... Um, the qualities uh, that we uh, uh, find in uh, people who have a PhD in social sciences and humanities, uh, I will not repeat what Anna, Mar Anna Maria said uh, or what uh, uh, our colleagues just said about qualities of uh, writing, organizing ideas, being critical, knowing how to find information. Something that I would stress and from a more personal uh, side is that uh, in our case, at CIDIS, we have some kind of a values or vision. We work with universities, mostly universities, because we believe on the importance of the uh, higher education, research, teaching uh, for the, the common good. So social inclusion, uh, education, and, and let's say colleague progress, to, to, to summarize. And, uh, even though uh, the, the, the attachment to these uh, values are spread out among uh, all persons who have done a PhD, you can assume that they have a, a, a vision which is a, a commitment to, to, to science. Uh, still, I think uh, that for people who do a PhD in social sciences and humanities, you can be pretty sure that this, this, this sense of values social inclusion, engagement, uh, uh, support to science, love of science, love of knowledge, uh, dissemination. Uh, this is something that is really rooted into these people and they defend it really in the first person. And for me, this is a quality that is very important. Thank you, Sabine. So I'm coming back to this uh, part of recruitment process because uh, we have a mini question on that uh, topic, so it will be um, for the moment maybe focusing on uh, Aziza, Ana Maria, and Sabid Ben Niagale from your candidate perspective. I would say, can you tell us about the recruitment process itself? Uh, what do you do with uh, people you uh, invite for interviews? What do you expect? What kind of activities you have uh, to check the person is the right candidate for you uh, to fit in the team? And um, also maybe to focus on the um, application and recruitment of international PhDs and more specifically people uh, who are um, refugees, for instance. How do you uh, deal with such um, candidates? Uh, is it something attractive for you? And why are you interested in such uh, profiles? Can you tell us from the employer's perspective? And then uh, from your perspective, Niagali, as a candidate, uh, because I'm not sure you recruit people, I don't think so, but uh, if you can explain, uh, for instance, and we'll start with you, Niagali, if you can explain uh, to us um, what kind of activities you went through when you have been recruited, for instance. 
Uh, in fact, I can answer both the question because okay, I'm great. also reflecting uh, different uh, background. But uh, uh, what uh, was uh, important? Uh, I think that uh, uh, as uh, I can't remember who uh, said that, maybe Aziza, I cannot remember, but I had a very uh, clear specialization, in fact. Uh, I was, and in fact, I also had a very proactive uh, approach, uh, which means that it's not always very easy to enter international organizations uh, because there are very different types of uh, uh, recruitments. For instance, now it's been changing a lot, and I, 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 I don't know how is it at the OECD, but uh, for instance, at the U United Nations, now you have to be put on rosters. Uh, before being able to apply to most of the position, uh, uh, excepting for those who, who, who are not uh, uh, permanent. But no, uh, uh, what does it mean? Is that you first have to uh, be part uh, of a roster and then you are proposed the kind of position uh, your profile is, uh, is, uh, is about. Uh, and this, this is, is a major change, I think, in the, in the way international organizations are recruiting today. For instance, uh, today I am on the roster of different level positions uh, within the United Nations rosters. Uh, I'm not interested presently by those positions, but it could change. And it's very important for people to know that they don't have only to apply to specific position, but also to apply to rosters. So th this is very important. Uh, as far as, uh, as I am concerned, when I was hired, uh, I was, uh, in fact, I went and, uh, vi and visit the head of the, the peace uh, and uh, it was the um, DHDP, uh, peace and political, uh, the, the name changed since then, but uh, peace and political department, uh, for the big department in the, the La francophonie and uh, I uh, because I have been able to uh, see that they had they, they had nobody working on peacekeeping and peace building uh, related matters so I made a suggestion and initially I was hired as a consultant as an external consultant and I was still working part-time for, uh, at the uh, Institute of Development Studies in Academia in, uh, in the UK. So I began to make commuting. So that's why when you are saying you need to have lots of uh, adaptation skills, I think it is a, go a good example. And then I've been able to demonstrate that there was a need for a real position uh, of peacekeeping and uh, peace building uh, experts, a permanent expert, and then uh, to develop this uh, position uh, itself to make a big program and that's where uh, I, I think they found an interest uh, in uh, in my uh, in my profile uh, so uh, I, the, the specialization i think it's key and of course uh, beyond uh, uh, being uh, hard working etc but uh, really all, most of the time i think that a phd are um, appreciated because of their specific skills, but also because they have shown they were able to have a proactive approach. I don't think that uh, it, it is important also, and that's where network is also matter, does, does, does matter. Uh, you, you, you can also meet people and 90% uh, uh, of the time it will give nothing. <laughs> but sometimes at the end, uh, you will uh, be able to reach your uh, objective. Thank you, Niagari. You want me to continue? Yeah, sure. So on, on the refugee side, that will be very quick um, because the OECD is actually the club of advanced economies. So we have 37 member countries and their, uh, you know, the industrialized economies in the planet. So we are hiring primarily officials uh, that come from those countries, that are nationals from those countries. So of course, 
two thirds of them are European Union, but you also have, uh, of course, US, Canada, in Latin America, you have uh, Mexico, Chile, and Colombia, and then you have uh, countries in the Asia Pacific, such as, uh, you know, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, uh, Australia, and Israel and Turkey are also uh, members. But you have a part at the OECD that is called, called the Development Center, whose job is really to work with non-member countries. So you have about 100 people there out of 3,600 that the organization is now, and, and who are hiring from those non-member countries. But it's really a tiny portion of the overall civil servants at the OECD. You also have the Sahel Club uh, that is focusing on that part of the world, and you have a global relations secretariat that is working a lot with Latin America, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, Caucasus, and, and Central Asia. So apart from those three departments that are more or less all together probably you know 200 staff the rest of the organization taps primarily into member uh, countries nationals now how do you get there you have two ways um, the formal official way is the uh, specific job application we don't have at the OECD anything that is close to the UN roster uh, system so you have job vacancies that are published on the OECD website you can put alerts by directorates uh, to receive them by email and, and, and therefore not to have necessarily to go and chase every time. And, and therefore, that's the typical channel when, uh, you know, you need someone with uh, specific expertise for uh, the departments. And that goes from the very junior analyst all the way through the director uh, level. Um, and then you have the other channel, which I would say more than half of the staff is actually coming from, which is, uh, the, the either the internship uh, path um, or I would say the sort of internal consultant which can go up to two years in the organization so you can be a staff of the organization but you're not a civil servant unless you have taken the competitive uh, process for specific job applications. Now when we hire on the official track um, you have usually, it depends. I mean, if you hire a junior analyst these days, I issued two vacancies a few months ago, you get 500 up to 600, sometimes 800 applications. Um, if you hire at the policy analyst level, it can go up to three, four, 500 applications. And then sometimes the higher you go, the, the, the higher the number, it really depends uh, on, on, on the type of job. If you apply, for example, to the Nuclear Energy Agency, which is one of the organizations that is linked to the OECD, it's such a niche that you would have a much lower number of applicants. I mean, I was recently in a panel interview for a senior analyst in radiological, you know, I don't even recall the name, it was like so technical, and there were literally eight people interviewed out of 25 people that had applied. So the, the more, you know, uh, niche is the application, the less number of the applicants. To be very concrete, you usually, uh, you have a number of screening questions when you apply to any vacancy at the OECD and those screening questions, your number of years of experience, the discipline of your degrees, et cetera, are used to filter. So it's very important that for those screening questions, you're really spot on. And then the hiring manager gets, you know, either the full list of applicants if he doesn't want anyone to filter for from human resources or this filtered list based on the screening questions. And then we do three things. One, you, we do a written test. It's anonymized. Um, two questions. Uh, people have one hour and a half. It's live and then they send it uh, to uh, the person and then you have two, three people correcting and then we come up with a short list. Then the second stage is a sort of video uh, interview, uh, sh very short questions just to see the public speaking capacity and so on of the staff. And then the third Third and last step is the, the typical panel interview. Usually when you've gotten to that stage, that means you have less than 10 candidates left. Um, the other path is, uh, is, is a bit more informal. It's, it's really, it doesn't require any competition. Uh, it's, it, you know of someone in a university that is doing very specific work and the person can come and stay at the OECD for up to two years. That's what the French legislation actually allows uh, for, for those sort of temporary staff uh, assignments. And then there's a lot of people that make it from this temporary staff to the more official, uh, I would say, track uh, applying for vacancies. Because of course you're in house, so you, 
you have a better understanding of where your skills match, what the opportunities are, you've networked around, people start knowing you. So don't, don't focus only on the sort of official track, build also the connections and send your CVs to some of the managers in the departments where you feel your expertise um, matters. I think that's it for me. Great, thank you very much, Aviza. And for Cyrus, how is it uh, organized your recruiting process and what do you expect and do you recruit uh, international researchers and maybe more uh, specifically refugee scientists? Yes, so uh, uh, here in Tiris, in Tiris we have a, a consolidated recruitment process. Basically, when we need to open a position, uh, we publish it uh, on professional networks such as LinkedIn, etc. We collect all the applications uh, and then we create a small committee uh, involving normally Monsignor Maria and myself. We uh, take a look at the CVs, we screen them by uh, double examination, namely we do blindfold uh, review and then we confront uh, uh, opinions to see what we agree and if we disagree we discuss. Uh, on this basis we organize a first round of uh, interviews uh, which are always by um, uh, video conference, video conference, because we want all candidates to be on the same uh, level. Actually, we notice that sometimes meeting some people in person and others by video conference can create bias. So, uh, first round of interviews uh, by video conference, interviews are led by uh, Anna Maria and myself. We have pretty different roles. Uh, in the interviews, uh, to caricaturize uh, Anna Maria is a bit like uh, the empathic uh, component of the interview and I am the more uh, rigid uh, <laughs> component of the interview. Uh, on this basis, we make uh, uh, a new preselection to those, let's say, 10 people whom we have preselected. We send a written test, both uh, well, let's say in English, but if we look for, uh, for instance, French speakers, the test will be in both languages. Uh, on the, based on the results of this test, we then re-preselect three, three or four uh, candidates whom we interview uh, presentially. And then on this basis, we make uh, our uh, selection. This said, uh, this is the normal process, but it can happen that uh, we recruit uh, outside of this process. Again, because someone, we make uh, an encounter. We meet someone who's really great. That person is looking for an opportunity. We may be looking for this type of profile. And then in that case, it can happen that we have a direct interaction with that person and we make this decision. Actually, we are uh, quite uh, flexible. We try to, both uh, uh, professionalized uh, recruitment processes, which uh, at the first years of series were more uh, case by case basis. So now we try to professionalize, but we don't want to renounce this flexibility, which is also important for uh, our organization. Do we uh, encourage uh, international application? Well, we are basically international. Uh, in series, uh, we are based in Barcelona. Um, almost none of uh, our staff uh, is from Barcelona. We are all from very different countries in Europe, in Southern America, uh, and in, in other countries. We would like to foster diversity always more. This is something that we say explicitly in our uh, job announcement. So diversity is an asset. It's clearly an asset. As a matter of fact, uh, and publicly speaking, we have never been confronted to an application coming from a person who is a refugee. Uh, it never happened, de facto. If it happened, uh, this application would be considered uh, uh, very positively, uh, still sticking to the same uh, criteria that apply to all candidates. So what would be evaluated in the first place would be uh, the adequation with the profile and, and the qualities of uh, project writing, etc. So uh, this would not be uh, put in question, but still, in fact, uh, this would be regarded as a positive asset also because we are looking for some profiles who have experienced uh, various things in their life. We don't 
we are not looking for profiles who would be uh, very linear trajectory PhDs and uh, I don't know. So you, you, you understand what I mean? Uh, we like people who maybe have dealt with complicated situations, things that, that give them an experience that cannot be replaced. In fact, and, and I'm not going to compare situations that are very different, but just to give you an example which is different, uh, the partners of the company met uh, in uh, Samarkand, uh, so in, in Central Asia, and they have, pl they have plenty of anecdotes of things that happened to them at the time. And so they had an academic career that was completely pittoresque and full of adventures, and it gave them something more. And this is something that they will appreciate uh, in candidates, candidates that have experienced various things in their life. And uh, I totally agree with everything that's been said. And maybe, maybe I would just like to add something about the, what we are actually looking for PhD, uh, for candidates. Uh, I would say, first of all, as Sabine said, we value a lot of diversity. And at the core, we, we look for applicants that share our core values. So all the different sides, all of us would, would like to, to make a contribution and to make the society a better place. And personally, even if I'm not working in academia anymore, but I still have that sense of fulfillment, that sense of purpose that I had when I was working in academia. So the first thing I would like to find is candidates they share that commitment to our core values, and also candidates that have some uh, some skills that are <laughs> linked to being citizens, like a curiosity and willing to uh, candidates are willing to explore and to be proactive. So all things that. Uh, usually PhDs have developed in their, you know, in their careers. And it's just to say that um, even if, well, we are an example of a private company that uh, are still a very uh, research-oriented approach. We also have some, in, we also collaborate with, through the research projects. But it's just to say that um, even when you go in, private, in the private sector, you can still find, uh, even of course with, with a specific background like a PhD in humanities and social sciences, a job where your expertise and your mindset as a researcher can be valued or will be valued. So that's just to really try and find the companies that appreciate the added value that you have. Okay, great. So basically you confirm the fact that basically you don't care about the country in which the people got their degrees, uh, but it's much more a matter of skills and personality. That's right. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, still to this uh, question on uh, recruitment process. Um, regarding the question, because it's a question that uh, appears quite a lot uh, among PhD holders, postdoc or not postdoc? I mean, most of you uh, did a postdoc experience. Um, is it worth it uh, for non-academic positions? And I would like to enlarge maybe this question to, um, to something you said, Aziza, because you started with internship uh, at OECD. Maybe can you tell us uh, and tell attendees where they can get maybe this kind of experience outside of academia because when they are going to apply for positions outside of academia, I suppose recruiters are also interested to see what kind of non-academic they got. So can you tell us uh, what you did maybe to get this non-academic experience and uh, once again, uh, postdoc or not postdoc, uh, is it worth it or not and how you can you promote or valorize this uh, postdoctoral experience for non-academic positions? Yeah, so I didn't do a postdoc. Uh, I was actually so sick after the PhD that I couldn't see on which, you know, uh, planet I would be physically in capacity to do the postdoc. Um, I, I don't really know, I, I, I don't really think we have a big share of postdocs at the OECD. Uh, I think we have a big share of PhDs that get into the organization straight after their PhDs. We have a big share of uh, PhDs that have academic experience and then get into the organization after the academic experience. But I, I wouldn't, I, it's hard for me to figure out, but I, but I can check statistically and let you know. In any case, it's not a big game changer for the OECD. I think the game changer is the PhD more than the PhD plus postdoc combined. Um, on the internships, I have to say, it really depends on the conditions that you have and the affordability that you have while you're you're doing your PhD. I mean, I, as far as I am concerned, I, I didn't have any scholarship. Um, and so I had no other choice than look for work opportunities during the research and the PhD. And that's how I basically 
started here and there and sometimes it was uh, internships but then it became consultancy and then it became like full-fledged work experience so maybe you have a much stronger incentive uh, to look for those revenues and to create those opportunities in non-academic fields when you don't have the scholarship rather than when you're tied to a laboratory or university and that comes with the teaching assignments and I would say uh, a sort of minimum you know uh, wage uh, for you to to carry out the investigation so i i think there you have really two different categories of populations but it's true that uh i i, I have the feeling that the opportunities for internships over the past 15 years have expanded uh, i remember it being very hard back in 2003 if you didn't have the right connections and the right networks and i feel it less being the case today, looking at, you know, uh, my, my brothers and sisters and uh, friends uh, that have kids that are now, uh, you know, in looking for opportunities in their early 20s. I think you have a lot um, uh, more sophisticated infrastructure, even in, in organizations like the OECD, you now have a full-fledged track to apply for internships, um, to be assigned to or to select or pick up to five directorates, to be in a pool and then to be contacted. But then apart from that, there is still room for you to ad hoc, um, send in ad hoc ways your CVs to people, you know, you may find from LinkedIn or other opportunities. So I, I find this environment being a lot more conducive today to experiment than it was probably um, more than a decade ago but I would really advise um, when you can afford <laughs> uh, to go for the internship option because I, I think it's a very nice reality check and it's a very nice opportunity to really have an entry door at an organization and then if it doesn't work it, it's not so much time and if it works it may be paying off um, yeah that's it Thank you, Aziza. Okay, so uh, I did a postdoc, but I really couldn't say if it's making a big difference. But what is important to, to know is that uh, a postdoc is a job. You're paid and it is a work experience. So that's very important. That did, what, that's where is the, <laughs> the difference with uh, the PhD, completing your PhD itself. When you're working, uh, as uh, when you do have a, a postdoc, you are working, you have a salary, and you're also entitled uh, to uh, go to, I saw a, a question uh, on Pôle emploi, uh, so you're also uh, opening your rights uh, in case you're not finding anything after, so I would say that uh, that's where is the lying, the, the big difference. Um, internship, I did some as well at the Ministry of Defense, the French Ministry of Defense in particular, at the very, but it was uh, in the course of my PhD and I did them voluntary because as I uh, indicated, I, I was lucky enough to have a, a scholarship all the, uh, for three years. So it, it was uh, easiest from a financial point of view, but uh, I also find it would be very important for me to get practical experience. So uh, I, I, I myself decided to apply for internships and uh, was just, I, I agree, it was not so easy to get some, but um, I'm not sure that's so easy today neither. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, but what, what, what can be done as well uh, is also important to say, and I did so, uh, is also to, to, to work, uh, to be self-employed and to work as a consultant. It is another option. And I think it is a very interesting one. Uh, uh, that's true that uh, you have a lot uh, to do in in terms of uh, managing your own uh, consulting activities because you have all those uh, social charges uh, to pay taxes and that's not the problem it's not to pay them uh, the, the problem is just to understand how it is working because you know you have different uh, uh, years uh, and in fact your tax uh, generally for the, your earning the, so for what you earned two years before so you could, can have very bad surprise but I think it is a very important option which can show you're not staying uh, without doing nothing and which is also helping you to build your networks but also to complete very uh, interesting work, work so I would encourage everybody to consider also this uh, this, uh, this option and also I 
think that something which has completely changed changed uh, the landscape uh, in the last, I, I would not say the last 10 years, I would say the last five years are of course also networks. I think it is also very important to find a way to make your intellectual work visible, which means that you don't have to only wait to have your articles to be published in uh, international academic reviews. That's very important, that's even indispensable. But I think you can also write very short pieces and to disseminate them uh, on LinkedIn, as uh, Aziza mentioned it, but not only. Um, Twitter can be also a good network, sometimes Facebook. Uh, because you need to build also your own community. And I think it is, it, it, it is also a good way uh, to find the way to insert yourself on the world uh, mar on the work uh, market the world market as well thank you Niagale. Anna Maria and Sabine well from my point of view well first of all uh, I did postdocs after, after my PhD and uh, I think I acquired <laughs> additional skills really during the postdoc so in for my personal case I, uh, I can say that well, there were useful experiences as for suggesting on whether they're useful or not, I really can say because I think it really depends on the case-by-case -case, uh, uh, situation in the sense that if the boss talking is a research topic that you like and if it's a good opportunity in terms of, I don't know, uh, work environment, uh, possibility to grow professionally and so on, of course it might be a good, uh, a good occasion. And also one has to consider that uh, I think that the approach to research is very different, whether you're a PhD student or whether you're doing a postdoc. When you're doing global stock, of course, you're responsible. I mean, you're, in, in first, uh, you're, uh, you're personally responsible for what you're doing, so which means that this helps also to develop other skills, uh, more oriented, for example, to leadership, organizational skills, so this can be useful. And uh, I think it really depends on whether you think that this is uh, for when you, where you are at, at the moment of the choice, if this makes, makes sense to, to you or not. And I personally also know people that had decided to leave research and then went on a post uh, on a postdoc on a slightly different team. They loved it and they continued research. So he, from my point of view, I, I don't feel I don't I, I don't feel like uh, giving a strong yes or no do it answers. I think it really depends on the situation. For me, it was a very good experience. Yes, to go on what Anamaya was saying. Uh, for us, having a postdoc uh, for a recruitment is not a condition per se. It depends on the postdoc job that you did. If it has uh, been interesting and valorizing for you, we will uh, take it into account positively. But postdoc for postdoc is not a requirement at all. Actually, uh, professional experience is not a requirement at all to work at CIVIS. We almost never hire people who come from consulting or who have an experience in consulting. This is the uh, exception. Also because we are some kind of a non-conventional consulting company, so in a sense, we almost prefer people who do not come from the consulting sector uh, because we have different ways of working that are pretty different. Um, so we actually, I could say that we don't hire people on the basis of their CVs. Of course, the CVs are the starting point on which we make the first selection, okay. But after that, between someone who has a great CV and someone who uh, makes a great interview and uh, provides a great answer to the written test, we will definitely hire the person who has the, the, the most appropriate uh, uh, intellectual qualities, which we can detect during the interview and, and during the test. So for us, the, the, the experience and CV is not really a condition. Uh, Something that for me almost is, is almost more interesting than professional experience is for, for instance, if uh, the candidate has done some uh, volunteering or uh, working for an NGO, uh, has spent some time abroad on a social project. This is something that can be seen on the CV and that for me is a very positive point. Uh, again, in, because of the values, because of the uh, um, uncommon experiences um, and, and capacity to uh, problem solving, for instance, adaptability. So yes, these are uh, experiences that I would uh, valorize uh, a bit more. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine and Anna Maria. So I'm going to ask you the last question um, before uh, um, closing the session. It's about networking because we, uh, you say that it was very important uh, for attendees to to be proactive, to meet people. So basically, to develop a network, um, and especially also in Yagale, you said working as a consultant, network uh, networking would be a very important part of this job because you need to find uh, new clients. For instance, can you tell us how you can develop a network in a country which is not yours? Because that's the case of our attendees. Uh, what kind of advice can you give them to develop this kind of network? And I would like also you to explain how beneficial it will be for the career development in comparison to just sending a CV classical application, especially when we are a refugee scientist uh, coming from another country with education, which is not um, uh, the classical maybe profile of uh, local uh, candidates. Can you tell us more about this networking, but quite shortly, please? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, personally, I think it's way more easy to do this today than it was 15 years ago. I think um, uh, 15 years ago, if you wanted to build a network, you typically had to go to academic conferences, talk to people on the margins of the conference, maybe do presentations, etc. I think in this, uh, with this Zoom effect uh, and probably the COVID-19 will accelerate this trend because people are discovering that you can somehow replace uh, physical proximity by digital proximity. You have a lot more opportunities for visibility at all levels of your career. And I, and I think, you know, whether this um, is uh, uh, plugging yourselves into the wealth of webinars that are being done these days on different areas and topics that relate to your research activity or um, using social media to post, uh, you know, opinions, uh, viewpoints, blogs, uh, op-eds, uh, anything that relates to your current research or field of investigation all the way through, you know, connecting via LinkedIn, joining groups, task forces. I mean, this is way more easy and cheaper today than it used to be in the past. Um, but one footnote maybe um, that I, I would really like to insist on is that actually the, the requisite for networking never stops. Even when you get your dream job, even when you get into the dream institution, and and I have to say there, at least in my in my career and within my team, I see a very strong gender bias. I think that men are extremely good, or often much better, at networking, at going to the ambassadors' cocktails at the end of the day, at uh, uh, being in all the you know sports clubs or uh, you know uh, arts clubs or anything that can be uh, set up as part of the staff uh, in initiatives than women and not only because they have you know probably more constraints and cannot afford but because they would be much more focused on delivering the final thing of the work that can probably wait for the following day rather than going to that cocktail where they need to be shown and they need people to to see them and because that's how you build this evolving network so I see a very strong gender bias there's a lot of course that has to do with personalities and it's not like a given and easy for people to be you know uh, uh, extra Averted and, uh, and 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 going towards the others, but but I think there are so many opportunities in the different companies today, and so many hooks that it's really something that shouldn't be forgotten, even when you are in a position, because this is what 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 takes you. Uh, what gets you somewhere is not what has gotten you to the place where you are now. It's, uh, there, there is a point in your career where your expertise is not enough anymore because experts you can always find and replace. What makes really a difference is the, is the social capital, the trust that you build around you. And for that, you need time. And, and, and that time is equally important than uh, the, the time you spend doing actually the work or core work. So, so yes, I, I, I think every opportunity whether it's digital or intra-company, intra-organization should really be seized. Thank you, Aziza. Uh, yes, that's exactly what I was uh, saying previously. Uh, being visible is key today and uh, I think I agree there are much more opportunities today than they used to be uh, 10 years, but in turn, Less, maybe less than 10 years ago, two days, you really have uh, the possibility to 
show the kind of work uh, you are able to complete or the kind of expertise and the, your added value. Uh, the, you have a, a number of uh, windows of uh, opportunities for, uh, for, for, for this. I think it is uh, very important to say, the, uh, to say them. But uh, sorry, I was about to mention something. Uh, which I forgot. No, I, I would I would uh, simply answer one question which, which was asked to me on how to do a consulting. Uh, consulting can have a bad reputation. You can say also expertise, but uh, you have a lot uh, of uh, a, a, a lot of offers for consultants. For instance, from uh, uh, international organization, etc. You have a lot, a lot of uh, offer of uh, requests. Uh, to, to apply. Uh, so just to look for, for them, be proactive, that's very important. But finally, what I wanted to say is about seniority. And I think that there might be a difference between the private se sector, which I don't know, and uh, academia, uh, multilateral organization, or public sector, maybe. Because as Isa was uh, rightly saying, that uh, you need to build your uh, social capital and uh, your own credibility, and it is taking time. Time. And I think this is a time we are given in a think tanks, in a, a multilateral organizations. There is, there is a prime for seniority. So I understand the, the fear of people who are applying the private sector, where, where I am told it is not exactly uh, the same uh, situation. Thank you, Nigeli. Anna Maria and Sabine, to finish. Yes, I will be uh, very short. I, uh, I will just add that uh, besides what um, what was mentioned by the previous uh, panelists, another op opportunity would be to participate to, uh, for example, volunteering op volunteering opportunities and causes that you you care about. Uh, this is also at least I mean it was interesting for me because uh, it got me uh, the opportunity to develop some skills and also to meet people like like Limandi that could me they could give me their perspective and their and their opinion. And then again, really. Talk about people that have gone through a similar transition, uh, uh, as you saw, researchers that have decided to change careers, even in different fields, because I can give you a different perspective, or fellow um, PhD candidates are thinking about doing it. Uh, and I think it can really help, at least, I mean, in, uh, in designing uh, approaches and methodologies to, to the job search. Thank you. And I will also be very short. Uh, maybe two practical uh, tips about uh, networking in foreign countries. I agree that it's quite difficult to, to be on a completely cold door basis. If you don't know anyone in the country, I don't really see how you can really put the foot in, into the door. Uh, so what I would say is first, uh, stay in touch with your colleagues who have become expats because they can uh, let you in. And uh, second, I think that uh, international conferences since you are a PhD, normally you should be taking part at least two, two or three of these events uh, a year. Uh, take this opportunity to make new friends and to stay in touch with them because they can also let you in in their networks. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Uh, Sabine, sorry, uh, just to uh, finish, maybe, um, can you tell us, uh, because the purpose of, of this session was uh, also to help uh, attendees um, to, to be connected with people, so would you, uh, as a panelist, uh, be, um, would you agree, I would say, with being connected with attendees, so basically if they contact you, would you accept their contact request, for instance, on LinkedIn, or do you accept being contacted by attendees? Sure. We would love to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. That's perfect. Uh, so we are going to finish the session. Um, I know that some questions haven't been covered at the moment, so we are going to collect all the unanswered uh, questions and we'll send to the panelists. So if they want to uh, explain or give more information on the questions we couldn't ask during the session because of lack of time, uh, and then we will send you uh, the answer. So do not worry, we we'll collect your unanswered questions and we'll uh, get back to you uh, as soon as possible. So we'd like uh, to finish, maybe uh, ask our panelists just to give us just one word uh, to help our attendees to develop their network or, or to help for their career development, which advice can you give them in one word? Proactive. 
proactive for Aziza. Great. Niagali or Anna Maria or Sabine, one word. Added value. Okay. And self confidence. Perfect. Uh, believe in your dreams. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists. It was nice to have you uh, during this session. And for attendees, uh, there will be a next session uh, in uh, 25 minutes uh, for STEM uh, fields, but uh, it was a pleasure to be with you and hopefully uh, this session has been helpful for your career development. So take care and uh, let's keep in touch uh, on LinkedIn or any social media. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.